Happy Sabbath and thank you so much for joining us for this service. It's kind of becoming a norm now, week after week, for us to be fellowshipping from our homes. And it's kind of a strange norm, and I'm not sure it's one that we really want to get used to. But there are many options out there for a spiritual blessing, and I'm thankful that you've chosen to join me for this sermon. So thank you so much. This week, we have lost in our church family a real pillar in the death of Garvin Michelle. And many of us are um, remembering him in a very special way for different things. But I just want to extend to the family our sincere condolences as you grieve the loss of such a wonderful man. And yet another soldier has put down his um, armor and is waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. So thank God for that hope and for the family. Our thoughts and prayers go out to you in this time as you grieve the loss of your father and Emmy, your husband. I begin this sermon by sharing an experience that happened on our farm. Now, our boys, during the time they were in their teen years and in their college years, they were responsible for taking care of the harvest, the cherry farm, the apples, and it entailed a whole lot of work. And of course, Brad and I were traveling a lot and we weren't here very much, but occasionally it would come time for us to come home. And mother would land in, Sp in Spokane, usually at that airport, and I'd give a call home. Now, what I couldn't see behind the scenes was that when mother called, there was a frenzy of activity because the boys needed to get the house ready. And so I can just imagine that the clothes were being rapidly picked up and thrown into the laundry. Um, the kitchen was cleaned up, the food put away, the counters wiped off, and the vacuuming done. They they were getting ready because mother was coming home and they would occasionally call me and mom where are you at and okay I'm at Cooley Dam and then I was at OMAC and then Orville and then I would arrive at home and I always knew that the boys had made an extra effort at the last minute because when I walked in the house everything was clean it was spotless and they knew mother liked to come home to a clean house but they waited until the last minute the last couple three hours to clean up the entire house well in their favor, I have to say that the farm work was hard work. And the last thing on their teenage and, you know, their minds was getting a, keeping a house clean. You know, well, that's what mothers or wives are for. Um, but they had all this work to do. They would be out early in the morning uh, spraying, sometimes till late at night, and coming in and just grabbing a meal and crashing to get a few hours of sleep. And the last thing on their mind was to keep the house clean. And so they would put off taking care of the house until mother was coming home. And I'm grateful that I always came home to a clean house because that always made me feel really, um, really good. Now, pro procrastination. What is it? Do we do it? Yes, we all have been tempted at some time. And procrastination is basically just putting off to tomorrow what really could be done today. Now, psychologists tell us that there are a number of reasons why we procrastinate. Sometimes it's not knowing what needs to be done, not knowing how to do something, not wanting to do something, not caring even if it gets done or not, not feeling in the mood for it, being in the habit of waiting till the very last minute to do something. Maybe it's believing that you work better under pressure, thinking you can finish the project in a last minute, or perhaps even lacking the initiative to get started. All of us have been tempted to procrastinate. Now, does procrastination fit in the life of a believer? Let's go to the book of Acts, and I hope you have your Bibles with you in your living rooms, wherever you're watching, 
and that you can turn with me to Acts chapter 24. And here in this chapter, we see Paul in a trial with Felix, the governor. And I want to pick up the story in verse 25 of Acts chapter 24. And here we see Paul, and it says, As Paul discourse, discur discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid, and he said, That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. This is a sad story of procrastination. When I find it convenient, then I will send for you. You know, Jesus told a very well-known story about ten bridesmaids. Now, the focus of this story is not on the bride, but rather on the bridesmaids. And we pick up the story in Matthew chapter 25. And it talks about ten bridesmaids who were waiting for the groom to come. Um, and they fell asleep. The wise, however, took oil in their jars along with their lamps. Verse 5. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, verse 6, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Verse 7, Then all the virgins woke up and they trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, They may not be enough. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. Verse 10, But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I do not know you. In the story of the bridesmaids, we see that five were prepared when the bridegroom came, and five had put off their preparation for the delayed groom. Now, verse 13, a little further down, it says here, Therefore, Jesus said, Keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. And so Jesus is basically saying, Always be ready. Pastor Randy Roberts, in his book, Waiting and Watching, says this, The surprise is not that the groom came sooner than was expected. No, the surprise is that the groom delayed, came later than was expected. The surprise was the delay. So how does this reality challenge or change the way we think about Christ soon coming? Do we put off preparation for Christ's return, or are we willing to always be ready? Now take your Bible and turn back just one page to Matthew chapter 24. And here in this chapter, which is dedicated to Jesus preparing his disciples and giving signs about his soon coming, um, he says here in verse 32, Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know the summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, even at the door. We're here in the beautiful springtime of the Okanagan. And this is such a wonderful time to enjoy. I love the buds that are popping literally every day. It seems like you see something new that's coming to life again. Indeed, springtime announces the soon coming of summer. And this is what Jesus was saying. As surely as you see springtime, be ready because summer is coming or I will be coming. And as we see disasters happening all around us and even in more rapid, rapid happenings, we know that Jesus is soon to come. So what does this tell us when we see just an escalation of natural disasters, lawlessness, um, 
the lack of moral values um, and respect for life. All of these uh, fulfillments of prophecies are signs on the journey toward the second coming when this world as we know it will end and Jesus will come. Now, in Luke, Dr. Luke gives us another little peek at Jesus' admonition to be ready. And I'm looking here at Luke chapter 12, verse 35. And Jesus says here, Be dressed and ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, you can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for the servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve. He will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. It will be good, verse 38, for those servants whose master finds them ready. Even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. And verse 40, you must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So Jesus very clearly said that we will not expect the coming of Jesus because no man knows the hour. Even the angels do not know the hour when Jesus will come. So we have to be watching and we have to be ready. So in contrast to uh, procrastination, Jesus is reminding us we always need to be prepared. We never need to let our guard down. The foolish are the ones who are only prepared for the now. Several years ago, my husband and I returned to Oliver after an extended overseas trip. We got home late in the evening and we went straight to bed. Early the next morning, we had a conference call, very early, and so we were attending to the conference call, finished the call, and Brad and I had come out toward the front of the house, and Brad stepped outside to get a stick of wood for the fire. As he opened the door, we heard the sound of our quad, and we both looked up, and I yelled, hey, somebody's driving our quad, and sure enough, a thief drove our quad straight out of the driveway as we were looking and watching. We were shocked. We did not expect a thief at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, we had come home late. We had left our gate open. We were unprepared for a thief to take our quad. Well, we were very fortunate in that the police were able to recover the quad and we did get it back. But the point is, is that that we were not prepared for a thief to visit our house, our, our shop, that early in the morning. And so just as a thief comes in the night, when you don't expect it, Jesus used that as an illustration to tell us how we needed to be prepared, we needed to be on guard, we needed to be watching and waiting at all times. It isn't good enough to procrastinate and say, I'll be ready tomorrow. Think about the story of Noah. Jesus talked about Noah. He said people were eating and drinking and life was normal and they were going on with their life. I like the story of Noah. Maybe it's just because Noah was a preacher and my husband happens to be a preacher and Noah and his wife had three sons and we have three sons too. I've always been intrigued with the story of Noah. But when you stop and think about what it must have been like to build that ark in front of all your friends and your family and to endure the scoffing and the, the hard work, the physical hard work of building that ark. And those boys probably grew up at their father's knee listening to how God had told Noah to build this ark. And then as they got older, they helped their father. And at the end, Noah had preached and preached. He had he had begged and pled for people to be ready to come and join him and his family in the ark, but not one single person would do it. They chose to delay, to put off getting ready for the crisis because they didn't believe there would be a crisis. Whoever heard of a flood 
Who ever heard of rain coming down like that? What's rain? And faithful Noah preached and built. And one day, miraculously, the animals start coming in formation into the ark. And still, those who had been given every opportunity to know and to be prepared laughed and they continued their eating and drinking and they missed the opportunity to be in the ark and to be saved. And it's a tragic story, but it, Jesus t reminded us of that story and used that as a way to, to tell us that that would be what would be happening in our world. And then Jesus would come. You know, in 70 AD, the fall of Jerusalem took place. And Josephus, who is a very famed scholar and historian, tells us that no Christians were lost in the destruction of Jerusalem. Why? Because they took to heart the messages that Jesus had said, when you shall see the desolation of the abomination of the desolation happening, then get out of the city. Don't even stop to go back to your houses for a coat. Get out. And the Christians had left the city and they were preserved. And terrible things happened in the destruction of Jerusalem. But once again, we see how God's faithful people who were willing to be prepared to be ready were saved you know when our boys were growing up we often told them choices determine destiny and the choices that you make today they may seem so small and insignificant but in the long run those choices form a trajectory that will lead our life to either eternal loss or eternal life. So choices are extremely important. You know, there's a promise in the book of Hebrews that I like very much, and I want to share it with you. It's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, and I'm going to read through to verse 38. Hebrews chapter 10. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he promised. What is persevering? It is being ready. It is believing he's going to come back and being ready. He, for just in a little while, verse 37, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who, are, who believe and are saved. There is a reward for being ready, and we can do that. God is going to help us. You know, one of the reasons that I think that people fear the end times is because it's a fear of the unknown. They cannot control what is happening and what God has promised will happen and the prophecies tell us will happen at the end of time. In the last few months, I've been studying the book of Revelation. I've been following the commentary of um, called The Revelation of Jesus Christ by Ranko Stefanovich, and it is a fabulous study. And I have been so thrilled, so excited, so energized as I see the pieces being put together. And yes, the book of Revelation warns us, yes, there are going to be very dramatic things that will happen. Yes, the end times will be difficult. There's no mistake about that. We cannot, uh, we cannot think that it'll be otherwise because we've been warned that it's going to be tough times. But the book of Revelation is a book of victory. It's a book of dynamism. It is a book of excitement because Jesus wins. And that is so exciting. Jesus is a hero of the book of Revelation. And knowing Jesus will make all of the difference. You know, we often say it doesn't matter what you know, rather who you know. And my friends, knowing Jesus as a personal friend, as our hero, will take us through the end time events. We don't know how that's all going to take place. We don't know how it will impact us personally. We may be persecuted. We may lose our life in death. But we know the hero 
of Revelation. We know who has won the battle, and we can hide ourselves in Jesus Christ and experience that victory along with him. Jesus, our friend. Jesus, our redeemer. Jesus, our coming king. Jesus, the creator, who will once again make all things new. Jesus Christ is our hero, and we can trust ourselves with our future in his hands. We need not fear. We need to just know the hero, Jesus Christ. So what kind of people should we be as we're living a life of being ready for Jesus' second coming? Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And in this book of uh, this particular chapter, Peter is writing, Dear friends, and he's writing to us about the second coming of Jesus. And I want to pick up in verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Repentance. God doesn't want us to be lost. He wants us to live. He wants us to join him for eternal life. Verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought we, ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. We ought to live holy and godly lives. So the question is, how do we do that? How do we be prepared? How do we be ready? I would like to suggest there are four things that we can do. Number one, daily be committed to spiritual values and living a life of God's grace and strength. Living a life that is led by the Holy Spirit, listening to the Holy Spirit, nothing between my soul and my Savior. Supremely motivated by what we do, entirely committed. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of something in our lives, we need to heed the warnings. So number one, be prepared for Christ's return by a daily commitment and following, allowing our lives to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Number two, faithfully using our gifts and talents. Someone once said, God walks between the pots and pans. And I'd like to add, he walks between the nuts and the bolts. Yes, God is with us as we faithfully do the mundane. Life is composed of faithfully doing the simple things over and over again. There's a passage in the book, The Will of God as a Way of Life, by Fred Sittler that I would like to share. He says this, We can always do the will of God as we know it in the present moment, however confused we are about the future. We can study hard, even though we may be unsure about our vocational direction. We can solve problems now that will equip us to solve bigger ones later on. We can meet needs that will prepare us for new opportunities of service in the future that might involve a great deal more responsibility. These simple commitments of everyday life lay a foundation for what is to come. The more diligent and faithful we are now, the greater our capacity to do the will of God later on. The more diligent and faithful we are now, we can prepare for, God's, for Christ's return by daily expanding and using our talents and gifts. Committed and faithfully using our talents and gifts. Number three, by compassionately caring for others. Ty Gibson puts it very well. He says, real Christianity is a slow, steady hum of deeds done in love for others. The slow, steady hum and deeds done in love for others. Doing what we can to alleviate the suffering of those around us. 
whatever that is. It might be helping helping out somebody who's just lost their job. It may be helping the orphans, the widows, uh, the worthy poor in our midst. And right now, there are many who are suffering with what's going on. It might be just caring and going the extra mile to show compassion to those who are really, really lonely during this COVID-19 time. But the third way we prepare for Jesus' second coming and to be ready is to compassionately care and help others. And then number four, by studying the Bible, actively in our prayer life, having a dynamic prayer life, and knowing God deeper, God's love is relational. It's a two-way street. It's learning about Him through the study of the Word. It's desiring to know more of Him. It's asking Him, Lord, what does this passage mean for me today? Lord, I need a promise for today. What does that mean for me today? We can be prepared by number four, continuing to seek and know deeper our loving Lord. Morris Fenden says, our only safety lies in determining to continue seeking God, regardless of what happens in our lives. Daily continuing to seek God. So number four, we prepare for Christ's coming by maintaining a dynamic and living experience with God. Four things. Number one, commitment. Number two, faithfully using our talents and gifts. Number three, compassionately caring and helping others. And number four, seeking to know God better. So back to Matthew chapter 24, where we started our journey. In the parable that Jesus told, he said that there were two men who were working in the field, two women who were grinding the mill, the hand mill. One was taken, one was left. One was prepared, one delayed, put off preparing. And this is such a powerful story for us, this parable. We can be taken, in other words, ready when Jesus comes, or putting off, being overwhelmed by perhaps just the busyness of life, maybe numbing what's going on by just the trivial, things that really, at the end of the day, in the greater scheme of things, really don't matter. By making those cho choices, we procrastinate in getting ready for Jesus' second coming. But we can be ready, and we can choose to live a life just simply doing the things that we normally do, but we're ready. We are ready. Lee Eklov, in a sermon entitled Heaven, tells the story of Robbie Robbins. Robbie Robbins was an Air Force pilot. He served during the first Iraq war. And after 300 missions, it was time for him to return home. And suddenly he got the orders, take your crew, fly your plane back to the United States. So they flew back to Massachusetts and they decided that none of them would tell their families. And so they landed and got in a vehicle and drove through the night to his home in Pennsylvania. And in the early morning hours, Robbie Robbins arrived back home. To his shock, he saw a huge banner over the garage that said, Welcome home, Dad! And he turned to his buddies in the car and they, he said, Who told them? How did they know? They all shrugged and they said, We didn't say anything. Robbie got out of the car and he went into the house. He saw his children half-dressed for school. And then he saw his wife come down the hallway. Her hair was done. Her makeup was done. And she was wearing this bright yellow dress. And she looked beautiful. And he said, how do you know? And the kids were screaming, Daddy, Daddy, you're home. And his wife Susan said to him, Honey, when the war was over, we knew you would be coming home. And we decided we would be prepared because we thought you would surprise us. So every day, 
we were prepared for your arrival. Every day, every day, that family was prepared for their daddy to come home. And I'd like to challenge you with instead of, I'll get ready tomorrow, rather, I'll be ready today.